So, for those of you who don't know me by now, if you've not sat in on the Code Immersion sessions, my name is Pat Maddox. I am primarily a Ruby and Rails developer who at some point in the last six months or so uh, discovered Seaside, which, oh, this is not doing what I want it to. Oh, well, we'll do it without it. So, Seaside is a web application framework that came out, or I at least heard about it, roughly the same time that Rails did. And for a number of reasons, uh, Rails gained a lot of traction, but Seaside didn't quite so much. But it turns out it's a pretty remarkable web framework. And it's got some really unique features to it that you won't find in Rails development. And in the same way that Rails made a lot of things simpler about web development in general, Seaside uh, makes, simplifies some other aspects of, of web development as well that are kind of difficult to handle in Rails. So just a quick overview. It's a web framework. Like I said, it's open source. Just like Rails, it's MIT licensed. That means that you can take it use it in your own applications, build upon it, use it at your business without any worries. It's written in Smalltalk. How many here identify as Smalltalk programmers? Two. Two in the crowd. All right. Well, you're going to find that Smalltalk is a beautiful language. It beats the hell out of Objective-C, as we're going to see in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I, it's, it's not even close. Uh, Smalltalk is, or Seaside is component based. So instead of setting up controllers and actions and requests and parsing stuff, you've got components that manage their own state and pass control from one component to another. Similar to, to Trellis that, that Brian talked about earlier today. And then finally, it uses continuations. And by using continuations, it manages a lot of your application state for you so that you don't have to be dealing with stuff in the session, so you don't have to deal, so you don't have to stuff <laughs> things in the database in between requests. And ultimately, it allows you to write code that expresses the flow of your application. So just to show you a quick, this is the canonical Seaside example, a little counter. This is a fascinating web app, right? It's something in the browser you see. We click a couple buttons, and a number goes up and down. So how does that actually get done? How are we incrementing and decrementing that number? Is it done with hidden form parameters or query parameters? Well, if we take a look at the HTML generated by, by the little app that I wrote, you'll see that it is pretty much what you expect. We've got, a, we've got a header that shows the counter number at that point, line break, and then we've got two links. And the links you'll see have very interesting URLs to them, probably ones that you were not going to sit out and code by hand. Right? You see it goes to the slash rwc counter, has a S query parameter and a K query parameter. These correspond to the session and then a key within the session. So kind of, uh, well, it's actually the continuation key. So at what point in the application session do you want to enter? So this will make sense in, in just a minute. But the important thing to know is that we're not passing the value anywhere in between a form or even the query parameters. We're not seeing 0. We're not seeing 1. We're not seeing whatever. It's saying, here's a session. Here is the continuation key. So it's managed in the session, right? But if that's the case, if we're just storing the counter ID in the session, then how do we do this? How do I open up a new tab in the same browser and you know, increment my number here, run through the counter example a little bit? I can go back to the first instance of it, change the numbers in there, and then I can go back and change the numbers. They're completely independent from each other. So if you're used to writing web applications where you store state in the session, then you typically put you know, a counter variable in the session, and then you would look that up, and then you would change it. But in order to have two of those, you need to do some special session handling. right? You need to say that, OK, upon coming to this first page, look up the first 
counter or create a first counter variable in the session, and then the second one that comes to it, create a second counter variable in the session, and then I, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how you would do it because you would then need to encode at least something. You would need to encode the particular session counter ID that you're using in the URL so it knows which one to look up. And that's what we deal with in a Rails application. This is an example of the typical request response cycle that you'll see in a Rails app. Client makes a request to the server. The server loads any necessary state that it needs to process the request. Then it handles the request, it ships off a response to the client, and then the interaction's over. Done. Any state that exists at the end of, of this interaction then needs to be saved to a database, or it needs to be stored in the session, it needs to be filed out to this, it needs to be saved somewhere so that when we make the next request, the server can load the state again. Typical stuff, no surprises there. Well, when you use continuations, it works a little bit differently. Starts off the exact same way. Client makes a request to the server, server loads the state, processes the request, and then sends the response back. But now instead of ending the interaction, it basically sits there waiting. And it says, OK, after we've done this response, the next line of code would be this. Or the next potential branches of code are these different ones. And it sits there, and it waits. And so it closes over the state, just like closures that you're used to in Ruby. It knows about the state at that point. So when the next request comes in, instead of starting at the top where it says low state, instead of like fetching state from the database, it basically starts at the bottom again, right where the previous action left off. So that allows us to write very clear, very clear, very simple code. This is all the code that I had to write for that counter example. Now granted, it is a very simple example, but I just talked about the problems with handling multiple counters in the session, that you would have to write some kind of plumbing code to be able to look up which counter I have to pass in a particular key. This is all the code that I wrote to be able to load up two counters. I can put five counters. You know, I can load up as many sessions as I want. And this is small talk code. We're going to look over the syntax in a little bit. But as Ruby programmers, I think that you know, except for some of the, the specifics of you know, how assignment looks and stuff, this is, should be pretty readable to you guys. Right? And you'll notice that this is just a very basic class with an initialized method. We've got an increment and a decrement method on it that increase and decrease the counter. And then finally, render content on is the method where we actually generate an HTML view to return to the client. And you'll notice that all the HTML is generated programmatically using Smalltalk code. So we say, I want a heading that corresponds to an H1 tag that we saw earlier. A break is our BR. And then finally, we have an anchor with a callback. Now, this is kind of interesting, because the callback takes a block. So the code inside of the, uh, the square brackets is a block in, in Smalltalk. And so basically, what we're saying is generate a link that, when pressed, executes that block of code. That's the, uh, what's the semicolon there? The semicolon is for cascading messages. We're going to look at, at how messages work in just a minute. But basically, when we call this, HTML is an object that represents a render. Anchor is a method that creates uh, an H tag. Callback says, you know, what's the action that you're going to do? And then when I use a semicolon, the object that, like, when you call messages in Smalltalk, so we're sending the anchor message to HTML and then the callback message to anchor. But now once callback runs, if we put a semicolon on it, that means that the next message that goes through gets sent to the same, to the same previous object that we use. So in this case, we're sending two messages to anchor. We're sending anchor callback and then anchor width, OK? Right? And so the, the important bit here, the interesting bit here, is the callback and the block, saying that when I click on this link, execute this block of code. That's pretty powerful stuff. Now, one of the things that you'll find in dealing with web applications is users hit the back button. And how are you supposed to handle that? Well, let's look at this really basic example, again, with the counter. If I increase the number to six, and then or five, and then ID, I hit back a few times. Now, I want to hit 
the plus link. What am I going to get on the screen? Evan says three. Any other guesses? Six? Six over here, so we've got three and six. Raise your hand if you're in the three camp. Handful and six. Smaller number, but the six is have it. Really? Now, why is that? Well, let's look at a, if I were to do this. You're still sitting on that next step. Exactly. If I were to do this in Ruby, what would it look like? This is, okay. if I have a counter control and I've got two methods on it, increment and decrement, and I call increment five times on it, now I have saved in the database a counter with a value of five. When I hit back a few times, the server, or the client doesn't send any requests to the server at that point. It doesn't say, now that I've hit back, back decrement that number, we have modified the state in the database, so the next time I send increment to it, it increases it to six. Does that make sense? Is that clear? No surprises there? But what if we do want it to be three? So I got up to six, I hit back a few times, and then I hit plus. What if I want to do that? That, you can imagine, is a very reasonable way to approach application development, that when I hit back, I transition back in application state, and then, so I basically reverted the, the changes that I made up to that point. A uh, good example so of this. It remembers the state of the page at that time. It remembers the state of the page at the time. So once I go back, now I say, when I click plus on it, it says, okay, using this continuation key, now, uh, you know, it, we know that it's three at that point that I rendered this page. So when you hit plus, then it should now, or sorry, it was two, now it should go to three. So out of the box, you're passing the continuation key around, but you're not always using it. Well, you are always passing the continuation key, but you never do it manually. Seaside handles all this stuff under the hood. You never, I, you pretty much never look at well, the session key or the continuation key. That's in that URL, right? Probably. That's in the URL. Yeah. That's in the URL. And the continuation key is actually the exact same as it was before. So none of that changed. The only difference is in how, is in how I configured Seaside. So this component that I had, now it's, uh, it tells Seaside, keep track of my states. So every time I render a view, these are the states that I want you to know about just in case somebody goes back. Okay? So this is a I, I guess this is, you could say, uh, well, that's the next slide. Well, obviously, that's not, but anyway. Um, this is one of the concerns that you have as an application developer. How do you handle when somebody backtracks? And there's not necessarily a correct answer in all cases. Most frameworks that you use sort of push you into an answer, and they don't give you much freedom with respect to how you want to handle this. And in fact, you'll look on many applications like loan applications or stuff like that that say, explicitly say, don't use the back button. Here is a link to press if you want to go back. Well, what happens if the user presses a back button? Right? Then you're kind of hosed. You know, the example that I like to use is what if you're building a web console for the President of the United States and he has two options he wants to perform on a country. He either wants to drop nuclear weapons or he wants to give them medicine and food. Well, he, act, he clicks on nuclear weapons, and then his advisor comes in and says, you know what, that might be a bad idea. But So we added the nuclear weapons feature to our aid package, and then he hits back, and then he chooses, okay, let's give them medicine and food. Well, when he hits forward again and submit, there's going to be two things on the server state. There's going to be nuclear weapons and food. So it's like, boom, here's, here's the medicine. Right. <laughs> you would like to be able to avoid that situation. So, Seaside calls itself a heretical framework. This is from a great Simpsons episode so called you, Homer the Heretic. So you probably want to make sure that you have a test case for that? Yes, yes. When dealing with nuclear weapons, always have test cases. <laughs> Seaside calls itself a heretical web framework in that it sort of shuns some of the best practices that we have adopted as web developers. For the most part, it does not care about 
fancy URLs, about pretty URLs. If you notice in the URL, it has the session key, it has the continuations key. If you are making a product catalog for Sony, and you say that the URLs are slash products, underscore S, 40 characters, underscore K, another 30 characters, that's not going to fly, right? Seaside, for the most part, doesn't care. You actually can send back pretty URLs, so you do have a nice URL in the browser that people can share. But sort of the basis of this is that if you want to do CRUD, if you want to do basic websites, if you want to just do resourceful stuff, then Seaside is not, that's not really what it's designed for. You don't need continuations to do that. You need Active Record. You need Resource Controller. It also gets away from the whole shared nothing architecture. In fact, Seaside basically says share everything. Seaside is maintaining all your state for you. So what that means is I can't go to one server and make a request and then go to a second server and make the following request like I can in Rails. Right? In Rails, I can load balance across a whole bunch of different servers. And because they all point to the same data set, and because they all have to fetch every single bit of information they need to process a request on every single request, I share none of the data so I can point to any of the servers I want. Seaside, on the other hand, because it maintains all the session state, if I go to server one for a request, I have to go to that same server for my follow-up request. Now that sounds crazy, and how do you implement that? It turns out that load balancers have done sticky sessions for like 20 years. So all you do is set up your server farm, throw a software or hardware load balancer in front of it, turn sticky sessions on, and you're good. So it uh, doesn't care about clean URLs, doesn't follow the shared nothing architecture, and then it makes some other opinionated decisions like how you generate HTML, which you saw it's all programmatic. How does that fit into a traditional web shop? So why should you care about learning Seaside? Why, why are you interested in this? Well, why, why am I interested? I'll, I'll be honest, when I first picked up the Seaside book, it's a free book online, I pretty much didn't talk to my girlfriend for a week. <laughs> it was, and I, you know, by Wednesday, Thursday, I was finding movies for her to go to and going online to moviesyahoo.com and buying a ticket for her and her friend so they could go hang out for the evening and leave me alone to code on Seaside. <laughs> so the first, first aspect of it is it is fun and it is addictive and it is cool. The whole environment that you deal with is, is an incredibly fun, refreshing environment to develop in, which is, which is kind of a weird thing to say that it's refreshing given that it's like 20 years old. But it's fascinating to me that modern languages still haven't really caught up. Now, this isn't going to be like a Seaside's amazing, everything else sucks thing, because I still love coding Ruby and Rails. But as you use this, you're going to see some cool new techniques. I think it's a very mind-expanding sort of framework and gives you a fresh approach to web application development. Plus, you can integrate it with your existing Rails applications, and you can use it for some of the things that Seaside is really good at that Rails is not particularly strong at. So there's a lot of reasons to use it. But honestly, I say, why not? Like, Rails is already a very heterogeneous uh, ecosystem. We have different data stores are coming up now. Everybody's all on board the NoSQL train. You know, there's where nobody, I mean, it's only very recent that people are using Apache to deploy Rails stuff anymore. We have a lot of alternatives in pretty much every single part of the Rails application stack. So my question is, why not offload some of the business logic too? And that is where Seaside Shines is doing the business logic and also some really cool stuff. Like the Ajax support in Seaside is kick-ass. And Comet, if you're not familiar with that, basically allows you to open up a connection, a persistent connection to the server and, uh, and, and ship, out, um, ship out content to all the clients that are connected to it. So basically, a uh, a real-time internet chat program in Seaside is four lines of code. 
Unfortunately, I don't have that example, but. <laughs> but. Can you write it right now? Like, well, it is in the, it's in the Seaside book. So if you want to go okay. to Seaside book, go to the comment chapter, write it, and then we'll hook it up. But I've got to get through a lot of stuff here. So it's really cool, but I, you know, I say, why not? Give it a shot. And uh, just for fun, as a little example, I showed those components how I can open three different tabs and do counter side by side. Well, here's those same components in a single page. And you'll notice, OK, I increased that one, right? Not too exciting. But then I go to the second one, and I see the first one keeps its state. And then I can go to the third one. I can just kind of go back through them. And I can you know, follow any of the links in that component that we wrote earlier in the 13 lines of code to handle that. Well, what? So these components manage their own state. Every instance of that counter is a different instance of the component, and it manages its own state. It knows about its own continuations. And the program that I wrote to do that three counter thing is this. It's another, I don't know what, uh, nine lines of code, right? And I say, so in my initialize, I've got my multi-counter page. You know, it's really fancy. And so I've got a list of counters. I create three new counters. And then when I render the HTML, I just say, OK, go through all the counters and tell them to render themselves. And in doing that, oh, and I maintain the state so I can use the back button. right? We saw how I can use the back button and keep the state even once I've used the back button, because Seaside's handling the continuations for us and managing the server state. And so I, is that interesting to anybody? Is that cool that I can create that one component, I can reuse it in a completely different context, and they all manage their own state? And there's no mention of session anywhere. There's no mention of cookies. There's no URL parameters. In fact, it looks kind of like an application. Go figure. That is basically Seaside's point, is that instead of writing code that is you know, process a request and then process another request, and how does all this stuff fit in together? If I've got workflow through an application, I want to actually see that in the code. I want to represent it in the code. And the fundamental difference between Rails and Seaside, or basically anything, any other web framework, any traditional framework, anyone that doesn't use continuations, is in Rails, you're saying, give me a link, and then it has a URL. So now the browser knows what URL to go to next. But in Seaside, you're saying, give me a link, and when I click this link, execute this block of code. This is obviously Ruby code, but imagine how cool it would be in Ruby to do that second line. And you actually can. There are a couple uh, uh, continuation-based frameworks. Um, I think Idaho is one. Is that right, Brian? Iowa. Iowa, Iowa and then, then there was another one. <laughs> I don't know. The, I won't lie. I'm from California. Those states are the same to me. <laughs> So, okay, we've had a little taste of Seaside. It, you know, it, it's that little taste of the drug that makes you want to learn more. Before you can code Seaside, you have to learn Smalltalk. Smalltalk, this big, massive, massive language. Java 1.5 has 50 keywords. Java 1.4 had 49 keywords, so feature bloat from version to version. Ruby 1.8 has 38 keywords. Smalltalk, massive beast that it is, has six. And in fact, it really has five. It has self, super, true, false, and nil. And then in modern implementations of Smalltalk, it also has this context. And in fact, these aren't actually keywords. These are pseudo variables. There is not a single keyword in the entire Smalltalk system. Everything is an object. And everything is done with message sends. This is not particularly exciting to, to Rubyists, but when I say that there are no keywords in the system, these are pseudo variables that the, that the virtual machine optimizes. It optimizes nil, optimizes true. If you turned off optimizations, you could change what nil is or what nil does and what true and, and, and false do. And so it's kind of like opening classes in Ruby, but, but on a much deeper level. And you can call anything, whatever you want, because hey, there's no reserved words. So Smalltalk has support for literals. Everything's an object, but certain things are represented better, typically as literals. So there are numbers, and there are fractions. They have fraction support, and there's decimal support. This uh, 
85 at 26 is a point or a coordinate. I don't know if this is an all small talk, but it's in Faro and Squeak. Um, dollar sign is dollar sign P represents a single character. A string is delimited by single quotes and only single quotes. And so if you want to use a single quote inside of a string, you use double single quotes. And it took me about three minutes to get over that. I was like, that is really ugly. And then it turns out it makes a lot of sense. It's cool. Uh, hash and parentheses gives you a literal array. And finally, there are symbols provided with, with uh, hash and a name. It works exactly the same way as symbols in Ruby. And finally, follow it up with comments. Uh, I guess you write comments and they go in double quotes. Assignment in Smalltalk is just slightly different than Ruby. Instead of an equal sign, you have a colon and an equal sign. And you can assign to local variables or block level variables or instance variables. And that's pretty much it. Those are the variables. Messages. Everything in Smalltalk is done via a message send. So it looks pretty similar to Ruby, except it doesn't have a dot. Well, it looks similar to Ruby until you get to the third example, which is my favorite part of Smalltalk, maybe, and which is something that Objective-C has, but clearly not as nice. <laughs> <laughs> so first, three types of messages in Smalltalk. One is unary. It is a single object receives a message with no arguments and nothing else to it. So you see, we can call one, two, three as string, and it returns me a new object that is a string representation of the number one, two, three. There are binary ones, which are typically for math, that are an object, an operator, and another object. And then finally, you have keyword methods. The method name in Smalltalk is called the selector. And in this case, the selector name would be called between and. And the two arguments that it takes uh, are, are 1 and 200. Well, 100, 200. I mean, it can be anything, right? So the, the part of the selector is the between colon and the and colon. And though that message is sent to the object 1, 2, 3. Now, this is not like Ruby, where it's a hash and you can just kind of pass whatever the hell you want to it. The message name, the selector name, is between and. It is only between and, and it must come in that order, and it must have those arguments. So you have positional arguments, like you have in Ruby when you call a method, but you also have keyword arguments. So the method is not just between 100, 200, something that's dif you know, difficult to understand when you've got a few different things. Uh, you actually write method names that, that read out nicely. And then last little bit, this is a cool bit of small talk syntax, is cascading messages. I went over this briefly. I send the paragraph message to HTML. And now if I delimit it with a semicolon, the next message I send will be sent to HTML as well. And I can mix up any of the messages that I want. So you see I'm sending three paragraph messages and finally horizontal rules. So this is a way to very concisely call multiple methods in sequence on a single object. Blocks in Smalltalk, of course, first class citizens, just like they are in Ruby, although they are, I guess, even more first class because you don't have to do any kind of conversion from a lambda to a block. You'll notice there's no lambda here anywhere. There's no conversion. A block is square brackets. And in Ruby, I can evaluate a block by calling block.call. In Smalltalk, I do it by calling block value. And uh, you'll notice in the first example, I assigned it to a temporary variable to use, so I could call it. But then in my second example, I just call value directly on the block. And we see first and second, those are your block level arguments. That's what gets yielded to the block. And I pass those values in by using value colon. So I'm saying this is a block that has two block arguments. I want to call it and put one into first and two into second, and then it returns the value of those two. Yes? You can also have variables that are local to the block. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then blocks get passed into methods. It's very, very common. Just like Ruby, I've got an array, one, two, three, and I pass it a block. Collect should look familiar to, to Ruby programmers. So some things to know about Smalltalk structure. It's class-based, single inheritance. Faro and Squeak. Squeak is a VM. Faro is a prettier version of Squeak, basically, because Squeak was built to teach kids how to program. 
or to let kids use computers. And it turned out it was a pretty good tool for building real applications, but people didn't like looking at orange and blue and yellow and big, round, fuzzy things. And seriously, if you look at Squeak, it looks like that. Faro is a far more professional implementation, but it also has some really cool tools to it. And, it, and so it has, mix, uh, has traits, which is not a small talk standard thing. It is specific to Squeak and Faro. Uh, there are implementations for some of the other VMs, like Gemstone, so you can write portable code. But porting code from one VM to another is doable, but takes time. Methods in Smalltalk, there is no notion of public, private, or protected. You can send a message to any object that you want. And Smalltalk programmers had this incredibly clever way of figuring out how to not send private messages. They have what are called protocols, which is basically a tag. It's a group of methods that literally say, like, these methods go together, so when you want to do this kind of operation on an object, deal with this stuff. So they create a private protocol and throw everything in there. The point being that you can call a private method if you want to, if it's in the private protocol. Smalltalk does not care, but fair warning, it's private. It may change over time, so don't get too used to it. But there's no notion of public, private, or protected, no method access. But everything is done via message sense. You can't do, except for, except for assignment, you've got, you've got three types of operations in Smalltalk. You've got method returns, you've got assignment, and you've got message sends, and that's it. You can't dig into an object and get its instance variables like you can in Ruby. Right? In Ruby, a, uh, I can call a method to say, give me that particular instance variable, and I can dig into that, but no way to do that in well, actually, I'm sure there's a way to, you can do everything in Smalltalk that you can do in Ruby. Well, do you really have attributes, or do you just have methods that have values? Uh, you do have attributes. You have instance variables, okay, right? So the, the, the instance and the, the, the object structure is basically exactly the same as what you're used to in Ruby. You have classes create objects. Objects have instance variables, right? Classes are objects, and Smalltalk does a very similar thing to Ruby in how it does the whole, well, OK, if class is an object, then what is its class? And what is the object type of that class? And so similar thing in, in Smalltalk. So even the control structures are done via, via message sends. This is if and else in Smalltalk. I say some number. Is it odd? If it's true, then you know, evaluate this block. If it's false, evaluate that block. Same thing happens uh, with Ruby. Blocks aren't, whatever's in the content of that block is not evaluated until that block is actually called. One cool thing you'll notice here is this is a single method with the selector if true, if false, but it takes multiple blocks. So I can pass around a block anywhere I can pass in any object. You don't have special syntax like in Ruby for passing a block uh, at the end of a method which limits you by only being able to pass one block. So if you want to have even more callbacks, you know, then you have to use Lambda, or you have to do all kinds of weird stuff. But this, if true, if false, one of the simplest constructs in any language that is always, always, always implemented as keywords and as, as special language constructs follows the rules of Smalltalk in that there's an object and there's a method. And so if you were to do this in Ruby, this is what it would look like. It's very simple under the hood. You've got a class that represents true and a class that represents false. And the if true and if false methods both take blocks. In Ruby, I'm, you know, I can use an implicit block, so I don't care for the ones that are no ops. But I say on the true class, on if true, call the block. But obviously the false class is not true, so they don't call the block that's passed in. Right? This is how Smalltalk does true uh, if and else. Another difference, the final, I, I guess the biggest um, difference small talk is image-based. So instead of having your source files and then running them inside of an interpreter or having a compiler run and starting up a runtime, small talk is, a, is an entirely self-contained environment. So the code and the runtime and all the tools that operate on the code live within this same environment. We're going to look at what it looks like in Faro in just a minute. But that is one of the things that is 
both a strong and weak point of small talk. Uh, if you use Emacs or Vim and you are just so in love with them, then you are going to not like small talk quite, it, it won't be as accessible to you. I really laugh when people have Vim and Emacs wars because it's just like you realize that both your editors suck and <laughs> don't know anything about the code. They like sit and they parse, they're glorified regular expressions with, with event handlers, right? Like that's what, John, that's what, John. <laughs> just wait. So the objects are living at runtime too and you can actually file them out so when I'm working, if I create some objects and I'm just messing around with them, they live inside of that image. So when I save my image, they all get serialized under the hood without me having to do anything. So when I load my image back up, all those objects are still there. So Smalltalk is a very, very living, organic system. I guess you could say one of the cool things with Ruby is how discoverable it is and how, how much I can mess around with stuff. Well, in Smalltalk, because it's image-based and because the objects are always live at runtime, I can do some pretty cool stuff with it. So the environment that, that I use and that you'll probably want to use is called Faro. You can find it at faroproject.org, or faro-project.org. And this is what it looks like. This is your Smalltalk environment uh, laid out so that I have the important tools up there, although constrained to a relatively small monitor and not laid out nicely. But I have in the top left my code browser, in the top right a workspace, which is kind of like IRB but more awesome test runner to run my unit tests, and then Monticello, which is the version control system for Faro. We'll, we'll look at all of these when in detail. That's your environment, that's the interpreter and, the, and everything. This is the runtime, this is the editor, this is the data, this is the refactoring tools, sure. this, is, this is it. Cool. So when you do... Word, not squeak. Not squeak. Right, 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 right. There this is, go. they took Squeak and they made it good for, for real programmers. Yeah. Um, they added a lot of tools like auto completion and stuff like that. So out of the box, it's a good development environment, good, develop, or good environment to develop in. So the workspace, like I said, kind of like RB, I just type small talk code in here. And then I can evaluate it so I can do stuff in here like, this is my little sketch pad, right? When I want to mess around with Smalltalk, I do it in the workspace. And I can just execute whatever code I want in there. Uh, so there, I was just messing with an array. Um, in this case, I want to assign a string to a local variable or a temporary variable. And then I want to call the as uppercase method on it uh, to, to see what that does. So this is. You know, when you're just playing around with stuff, trying to, to understand how some of the objects work, then you use the shout workspace. So it's like IRB in the sense that I can evaluate code in there, but the code that I run in there, it actually, like any data changes that I make, like creating any objects, are stored and local in this workspace. So I can reference those in subsequent subsequent uh, messing around and playing with code. And this is actually a really cool point to start your test-driven development. You write some code, you copy it into, uh, in, into a test case, and then run that and, and go. So it's fun. This is the class browser. This gives you access to all the source code in the system. And you see that on the left there, we have the classes for all of the code. This is the entire VM, everything that implements everything, including how message sends are done, including how collections are done, all the way up to higher libraries like database access or Seaside and eventually my own applications. The refactoring tools are in there. I'm looking at the protocols here that I mentioned. And you see on the right, it shows me the methods that belong to that protocol. So I'm going to scroll down to some code that I wrote. And you'll notice, like, here's the class. I've got some buttons here that show me some stuff. I can look up my class hierarchy. So I can say, I know that I've got this RWC counter. It inherits from WA component. There's the entire class hierarchy. And on the right, I've got the methods that are defined in each level of the class hierarchy. So at this point, I've got an insane level of discoverability here. I can look at the variables that I have. I just click in the variables, and I see where they're referenced to. So I've got a count variable that is referenced inside of render content on. 
And it's also referenced and initialized and then increment and decrement. And those, I can basically keep following the chain and I say, where is increment called from? Where is render content all com come from? And I can start to explore all my code and, and, and really find, uh, you know, find what I'm looking for or a lot of stuff that I'm not looking for. I can look up all the different implementations of a method name. So this is every single implementation of that method render content on in the whole system. So if I want to see how other classes implement this method, I can do it. And then finally, uh, we're looking up inheritance. Is that what that says? I totally lost track of what's going on right now. I don't think that's that cool. So I don't know why it's there. But I can look and I can see everywhere that render content on is actually called from. So I've defined this method. One of the cool things is, or one of the questions is, now that I've got this method, where is it actually called from? And here is every single spot in the entire VM where the method render content on is called. Now I can actually scope all these down. I can say only look within this one package. So I want to know where this method is called within this set of classes. And that allows me to basically track down all the areas where, uh, where, where my method is called and, and what might be affected if I make changes. So that's the class browser. It is, uh, you'll notice in the bottom pane here, that's actually where you edit your code. That's the whole code editor for Smalltalk. And when you click on a method, it shows the method in the code. You don't have really big ass long source files and you can't get big ass long source files. It's individual methods one at a time. I've, going really fast, so I might have missed it, and I looked down for just a second, but do you have, a, that's not a criticism, but can, can, can Pharaoh show me where classes are reopened and methods are redefined in order so I could see, for example, all the monkey patching that may have gone on on a particular method? Monkey patching as it exists in Ruby is not quite the same in Pharaoh. What you have are, okay, well, one cool thing is if I look at, I was going to stay away from light coving because as much as I like it, I always screw it up. One thing you'll notice here, render content on has a little up arrow. That means it's overriding a method from the superclass. There's a method in somewhere up the hierarchy called render content on. We're overriding it. Similar thing happens if I go up the hierarchy and look at it. I look at render content on. It'll say that some class overrides it. But you have mixins too, right? I, well, so Sort of, and I haven't used mixins in it, so I don't know the answer to that so much. I mean what I text, so. do know is I'm trying to find if, if I can find a good example of, oh wait, I have to pick the actual class. So, okay, I don't have an example that I can think of off the top of my head that has it, but in these protocols, you see running and testing in private. You can do what are called extension protocols. So I, and we'll look at this in Monticello, which is the version control system. But basically I can say, create these methods on this class. So I actually can create new methods on one of the existing classes. And when I look at it in the class browser, it's gonna show up in a special protocol that's gonna have an asterisk and then the name of the package that it was defined in. So if I wanted to make you know, my special RubyConf methods on string, I define them inside of string under the special package, under, under that special protocol. Now when I add it to Monticello, it goes into version control along with it, so I can pass that along. Right? So any extensions that I make to the core system, oh, I have 14% battery. Um, any extensions I make to the core system, then get shared. Huh? I'm out of time. Okay. Can I go for a few minutes? Yep. Okay. We'll go to the battery days, I guess. Because so. <laughs> there's some cool stuff. I'm going to show you some of the tools. I know you should sell like benefits and not features, but I think the features are cool enough here that, that you will look at them and figure out benefits for you. Um, Oh, this one's fun. Method finder. How do you upcase a string in, C in Smalltalk? I don't know, but I know that I want to start with lowercase ASDF and end with a uppercase ASDF. OK. And then it tells me where it is. Oh, it's string as uppercase. Oh, and then I can browse it. Cool? Yeah, I knew it would blow your mind. <laughs> oh, god, this is so much fun. Refactor method. 
that one line I want to extract to something. So I will just select it. I will extract method. I will call it something that makes sense, like render heading. Hit OK. Smalltalk says, is this what you want to do? I say, yes. That looks about right. OK, so I'll accept it. Right, and so now we see in my render content on, it defined this new method, render heading on, extracted the source out. We see that over on the right side. I can extract the rest of the source out. Um, so we'll just create a new method here for the actual counters. I like narrating my videos. This is better than trying to do it live. And then for my final automated trick, so it's showing you the methods that I have. OK, I don't want to show this now because I want to skip past the refactoring. But I think what I do next is I create a superclass of my component. So I basically insert a new class to it. And then I take the two methods that I had on that subclass, and I push them up to the base class. So in a matter of two minutes, going slowly because I want to demo it, I am able to take some source code, extract methods, insert a new superclass, and move methods around to the classes in which they belong. Refactoring is fun. People don't do it in Ruby because refactoring tools suck. Smalltalk has them. Uh, I forgot which one this is. Oh, this is the object inspector, in which case I have an object and I can actually look at it and I can start to look at what's inside of it. So I have an array. It's got some elements. I've got this little interpreter down there that uses where self is the context of the object that I inspected. So now I can just start to run methods on that object. I can click around through it. I can look at it. Like I said, very discoverable. Very discoverable. You can experiment a lot. It's really cool. Uh, this is Monticello. Uh, on the right are basically change sets. It's a completely different thing than what you're used to. Smalltalk doesn't work with Git. but. Um, has its own advantages. I can look up the change set. I can see all the code that's in there. I can pull in little bits. I can merge it into my system. I can replace parts of my system with it. Very, very powerful. So on to Seaside, which will burn through, like I said, programmatic HTML. I have this one method where I write a bunch of small talk code, and it creates this very ugly formatted uh, form. And you'll notice I've got callbacks on there that say that when this, basically, the callback on text input says that when we submit the form, take the value of whatever's in that field and store it and, and call the method email, which stores it in a local variable. And Seaside gives you kind of a shortcut for that, saying you know, on and of. And so that, that's a shortcut for that. Now, when I submit the form, I have the data for the user. I want to validate it. I want to save it to the gateway. I have a sign up button. So again, this is specifying the code that you want to happen in the place that it should happen, and Seaside just sort of takes care of the rest. I have, so why is this great? Well, it has small talk semantics. I can actually, uh, I, I'm writing in small talk, which is fun to do. It produces 100% valid XHTML. I don't have to deal with square brackets or angle brackets and stuff like that. It's just done. It's refactorable. That's the best part. I can take three lines of code. I can extract it. That's awesome. Why does it suck? Well, what happens to your HTML? Personally, I don't care, but some HTML designers are really big on being able to edit their own HTML. <laughs> but you know, one of the Seaside's opinion is, we generate the HTML, you do the CSS. Hey, wait, we have lunch, right? <laughs> so I'm just going to keep talking for a little while. You guys feel free to go grab lunch. Spoiler alert, this is the best part of the whole talk. <laughs> In case it's not. In case it's not obvious, this is Alexander Graham Bell on the left. And there is Steve Jobs on the right saying, holy cow, my iPhone is so cool, I can actually receive telephone calls from Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> so call and answer, two methods provided by Seaside on components. They transfer, call transfers control to a different component, and answer returns control back to the calling component if it wants to. Are you hooking me up with power mic? Thank you. <laughs> We're getting there. See, I knew this was so, thanks for scheduling it during lunch. This is so cool. Um, OK, so what we have here is render content on. Again, we're just generating the HTML. And you'll notice in the first, on the third line, I have an anchor. And my callback now, instead of setting a variable, it says, call this other component. 
And so I'm saying instantiate a new instance of this component and then call it. And then somewhere along the way, doing that is going to return a value back to me that I then assign in this variable. Well, what happens when I do that? I've got a uh, second component, the one, the RWC value prompter, that just has a form. It says enter a value. And then in my callback, I say answer with this value. So what's going on here is when I click on the link, like so I render the component the first time, it'll show a bunch of HTML. When I click on a link, it'll transfer control to the other component. It'll let that component do whatever it wants, which could mean transferring control to another component. And it could go down, on and on and on, until eventually this component says, I'm done. Here's the value. Here's the response. So the second component takes the callback. Once somebody submits the value, it answers it back. Now, what does this look like? Well, I click Enter Your Value. A new component comes onto the screen. It returns it. I move on to the second one, get the value, return it, and then I see the sum. So if you look at the code again for that, right? I said get the first, com you know, uh, get get the value of the first first number, get the second one, and then sum them. But the actual getting the value, that entire control flow, is not done in this component. It just says transfer that off to another component. So this is insanely, insanely powerful. Now, the closest thing, Seaside it doesn't really. Uh, it doesn't think that MVC is, is all that it's cracked up to be. Uh, sometimes your view logic actually goes along with the data that it works on, and so maybe you should put those two things together. Well, the closest thing you get to controllers is this WA task, which basically allows you to define a flow control and then yield control to other components. But I can write the actual control in a way that makes sense and, and represents the control, and then let those components deal with the whole rendering the HTML and, and getting the values. So I can streamline all that code to this. I've got a new method, go, which is what's on WA task. And that whole uh, RNC value requester or whatever, that is actually something that I made up for the purposes of this example so you could see how answer works. But because that's such a common thing, it's built in to Seaside as self-request. So when I call self-request, that actually creates a new component, it calls it, it lets that component do its thing, and then it returns the value back. So once I've gotten the first number and I've gotten the second number, now I can create another view that actually sums those together and I pass control off to that. So in this way, I'm able to write code that represents the control flow through my application via my tasks and then delegate the actual user interaction part to components that manage their own state and that are able to return values to the, uh, to the task and, and keep going. So that looks the same. Basically, I enter a number because that's what was requested. I enter another number, and then I get a sum. Yeah. So significantly shortened code. So how do you use this with Rails? Well, this panda loves using Rails for CRUD because Rails is awesome at CRUD. But you know, whenever he does complex configurable workflows, it makes him sad. I've done lots of complex configurable workflows in Rails, and it is a gigantic pain in the ass. And you always have to go through some kind of judo to, I, like, I've mixed in modules on the fly to the action and, and done all kinds of weird stuff, and it's just not fun. And this guy wants his backbone back. He says, I want control of how the user interacts with it. You know, maybe he's just a .NET programmer. So, but, so how do you actually do this? Well, you can integrate through the database. That is like Seaside can actually connect out to a database and it can you know, use all the data in there and you can fetch it just like you can in a Rails app. And that works just fine. But now you've got this interface that you didn't really define between the two applications. You're working on a sort of fixed data structure and it's kind of brittle that when I make changes to that data structure, I have to make sure that the, the other side of it works. And Smalltalk has much better ways of dealing with persistence anyway. So you don't really want to, uh, you, you don't want to go through the database. So you can also do Seaside as a service, which uh, you can do JSON and XML APIs, or you can, in your Rails app, use Mechanize to go through and, and kind of click through. I would have loved to have had a gem that just handles all this for you, but frankly, as I've been using this in my own work, 
Uh, I've been coming up with different ways of doing it, so it's still, still sort of figuring that out. But it works really well to, what, what I do is I make my initial request to Seaside, I store the entire response document in the database, and then I use Mechanize to parse out the URLs. I kind of transform those URLs on the Rails side so that when I click a URL on the Rails side, it, uh, Rails goes and figures out which URL that was on Seaside, it makes the request, and you know, comes back. So I, basic, I can delegate all my complex workflow stuff over to Seaside. Maglev, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Maglev is a project from Gemstone that lets you run Smalltalk or run, lets you run Ruby on their VM. And I was talking to Monty a little bit, and I said it would be really cool if I could run one Maglev instance and one Gemstone instance, and basically run Seaside on Gemstone, Maglev or Ruby and Rails on Maglev, and then have them share objects back and forth. And apparently, that's entirely possible at some point. Because what, what Maglev and Gemstone do is let you run multiple VMs, and they just transparently share objects, right? And so what I could do if this happens, when this happens, and I'm pushing him for it, is I can define my validations in Rails, and then I can use Seaside for my complex workflows. And because those objects are just transferred from one VM to another, automatically without me having to do anything, that means my Seaside code actually uses the validations from Rails. That is a holy shit if we can make that happen. That would be so freaking cool to, to be able to do this. And it's going to totally change the way you develop software. So hopefully this happens. Um, if you want to learn more about this stuff, feralproject.org is where you learn, uh, is where you get the VM. Seaside ST is the Seaside web application framework. There's some free books. For example, you can download a free PDF. Uh, book Seaside ST is free online. You can also pay like $12 for a PDF. Squeak Source is the open source kind of like GitHub for small talk, although it's really ugly and not as efficient, so it's more like SourceForge than is GitHub. And that's really all I can think of, so thank you guys for uh, staying into your lunch break. I'll leave the resources up. You know, any questions? Any, yeah? Yes. So with the uh, uh, payroll, can you uh, uh, add uh, um, uh, methods to an instance of logic? So, OK, so the question is, in Faro, can you add methods to an instance of an object, so like singleton methods in Ruby? I don't know. Can you do uh, regular expressions? Yes. It has regular expressions. There are a few different libraries. They are, it's not quite as clean as, as Ruby's, I guess. Uh, one of the things, Ruby, basically, if you looked at uh, Ruby's history, you could say that Ruby inherits from Smalltalk and includes Perl, right? And so you've got the really nice Perl regular expressions in Ruby. Uh, you do have regular expressions in Smalltalk, but just not as nice. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't had a in particular interest in building things other than Seaside, really. Um, so I do know that you can create uh, OS-specific binaries that kind of bundle the VM in there, and they can hook into windowing systems. I haven't done that, so I don't know. I do know that there's a guy that used Squeak to write an iPhone app. So, and it was on the App Store, and I'm not entirely sure how that worked, given, given their restrictions. but. Those restrictions are gone, so you know, all due respect to Evan, who, who's not here, so I can say this. He just showed you Objective C. Hey, if you want to code Ruby or Smalltalk on the iPhone, I think that's probably going to be a, a much more desirable route to go. Yes? Uh, what is Monticello? Monticello is the version control system, and it basically stores the change sets in more of a binary form than, than, than just text files. But um, it has little packages that you can ship around and that you can push out to public Monticello servers, and people can browse, and people load it in. So you don't use Git, you don't use Subversion, you don't use CVS, you don't do any of that. Uh, it's all in the environment. Monticello is your version control system. Is it easy? Is Monticello easy? Yeah. Yeah, there's good documentation for it. And the only question that that you ever have really is, do I want to load these changes in and replace some of the code that exists there, or do I want to try to merge it in? But in terms of using it 
I like to, to save my own changes out and create a, a nice version history, totally doable. I don't know if you rewrite history like you do in Git, but, um, but it's more like you can cherry pick versions. And so I can say, give me the latest version, which will give me everything up to that. Or I can say, give me that latest version, but ignore everything else. And then Monticello will complain if the system is not capable of supporting it because the new code change includes a call to a certain class or a method that doesn't exist. So it will warn you for some of the stuff like that. This, it, it kind of takes a while to wrap your head around some of this stuff, but you know, if you take a week to go through the Pharaoh by Example book or the Seaside book, you pick up a lot of stuff and, and it should be pretty exciting. Um, yeah? Sorry, can you speak up? How do you handle deployments is the question. Deployments in Seaside are completely different than anything you've ever done before in Rails. And in fact, there is no single model that works for every application. Basically, the way you've designed your application has significant influence on how you deploy it. So some things like uh, DabbleDB, which is, is, which is a cool uh, tool built by Avi Bryant, the dude who wrote Seaside, their model is to have one image per customer because the customer data does not relate to each other at all. People are just creating their own databases online, maybe sharing views with other people. But if I want to get data for a particular customer, I go to a single image. Now, an image, once you've stripped out all the development tools, is roughly three megabytes plus whatever you know, massive data the soccer mom put in there you know, making, making her, her call list over the weekend. So, you know, the point is hopefully you uh, uh, are charging enough that you can afford to store three to five megabytes worth of data on your servers per customer. Um, and then they write some scripts basically to bring up the image into a VM process on the fly depending on when the requests come in. Um, other, typically what you do is you have multiple, multiple images running and uh, if you want to share data between them, you use something like an object database like Magma or Goods, which are both some of the persistence options. All the persistence stuff is laid out in the Seaside book, by the way. Uh, and then you could, of course, use Gemstone, which kind of handles all that for you transparently. So the key point, though, is that you have to have a load balancer that does sticky sessions on there so that requests coming in that are part of the same session go to the same image because they don't share data unless you configure them to. Yeah, you can absolutely handle many users in a VM. It's just kind of a matter, or in a single image, it's just a matter of how you want to, to lay that stuff out. I, I guess one of the sort of frustrating things is like, how do you do persistence in this? And like some questions of how do I do this? Well, you'll Google it and there will be a blog that says, oh yeah, persisting your entire object structure is these nine lines of code. And so you're like, well, how come there's nothing like Active Record that lets me just save stuff? It's like literally because you can write your whole persistence mechanism for your entire, for your entire data set in nine lines of small talk. And the way you structure and design your app is going to have a significant effect on how you choose to persist it. So there aren't really, I, I mean, there's some off the shelf solutions that, that let you like goods and magma that are object databases that do this stuff for you. But you know, it is also nine lines of code to write it completely customized to your application's needs. Uh, Mike, did you have a question? Are you telling me to shut up? Oh, no, no. Um, <laughs> how, do we, uh, how do we convince Gemstone that we want to share our objects between Maglev and Seaside instances? Like, you email. So that, that was like, that was like mind blowing, you know, that idea. Yeah. Um, you guys, if you haven't seen Maglev examples yet, first of all, Maglev is on GitHub. The whole thing's not on there, but you can install Maglev and you can use it. And it allows you to, I don't have it configured on my machine because this is new and when I was trying to set it up for this, I had problems because I was using RVM instead of the, I, I would recommend not using RVM for Maglev. But you load up two IRB processes, you define a class or an object in one of them, and then it is available to you in the other one. So they're two completely separate Ruby VMs running. 
but they're sharing data back and forth. So the question is, can we do that between a Smalltalk-specific VM running Seaside and a Rails-specific one, uh, or a Maglev one running um, Ruby? And the question, or what you need to do is email this dude, okay? Who just emailed me? How about that? Don't get out my email address. <laughs> right? So if you guys can see this, can you see that? I'll just, I don't want to tweet it. But I mean, he is on Twitter too. Um, if you email this guy and say, so Pat Maddox was telling us about Seaside, and he said you can make it run Ruby objects next to, or a Ruby VM next to a Maglev VM, and we can just share our objects back and forth. When is it going to happen? I don't know, maybe it goes bumped up on, on the feature list. Presumably, they want to get it working Rails in production and stuff first, but this is absolutely one of, one of the things that, that they're considering right now. And he's on um, BJ. Do you know his Twitter name? He's Monty Williams on Twitter, too. Right. So he's basically the guy running Maglev at this point. Another question? Well, I, I know a fair amount about Gemstone and Smalltalk and all that stuff. And and I'm sitting here, I, I can see very easily how Gemstone can accommodate Seaside. Uh, and ask, making their database look like an SQL database because Rails was very SQL oriented. Right. Uh, is a whole other matter. I'm, I'm, I can see how they might take Rails at a high level and, and, but never really have SQL under the cover. Uh, right. Um, Absolutely. I don't know which way they're going on that. Some people might want some SQL somewhere. Totally. So uh, <laughs> comment is Seaside is an object database. It doesn't really fit into the whole Rails active record RDBMS mentality. I do know from conversations with Monty that having database adapters that can at least go out to Postgres and MySQL is a very high priority for Maglev. In fact, it probably works in some, in some state at this point. So you're so your Maglev, so your Rails applications running on Maglev can continue to run unmodified. I say, screw the relational database. It's not interesting. It's a horrible, horrible place to store application state. It's phenomenal for reporting, but when I want to store an object structure and I want to store, uh, you know, I want to store my application state. It's not particularly great at it, and it's only until you start messing around with objects and they just save automatically for you and you don't even have to think about you know, them going to a SQL database that you go, oh, hey, this is a really, really cool to write, way to write software. You deal with objects, you write application code, it all kind of just works, and then you absolutely write some, um, uh, write some listeners for when stuff gets saved so you can write it out to a reporting database and do your querying and reporting from that. So, yeah, uh, big priority to have Rails and Active Record working on Maglev. I say that that is not nearly as exciting as being able to totally change the way we write, we write Rails applications. Yeah, follow up? Do you, do you have any idea how long object-oriented database people have been trying to get some sort of market share, any market share? Well, they do in like financial <laughs> systems, right? Smalltalk runs like 60 to 70% of of big financial systems on the New York Stock Exchange and various different trading firms. So, you know, and that's where that's where uh, Matt, or that's where Gemstone makes their money right now is like those big enterprise applications that have complex domain models, complex business logic, uh, and then need to be able to share that across across many many servers. So, um, unless my th uh, okay, yeah. So I was, okay, so the question is, what kind of performance do you see with this? And especially, I would say, with the architecture that I came up with, which is have your, or have your action controller make requests to Seaside and then do some stuff with it. I prepared a lovely benchmark that would prove demonstrably that it added 10% of overhead maybe to make a request out to Seaside and do it. And then when I ran the benchmark, it totally pegged my VM. So. Turns out that that you know that grand idea of this uh, was was not accurate, but that was running with the VM in development mode, so it has all those tools. And so like the VM 
at, or the image with all the tools is like 45 megabytes. And when you strip out all the stuff to only what you need to run Seaside in your application, it goes down to three megabytes. So the, basically, you know, me running, running performance metrics and benchmarking against the development environment was, like, just didn't work. Um, so far, you know, I'm, the, the places, well, when I've used it, it's still just been in development. It's only applications that are in development. Um, there, are, there are applications in the wild that are using Seaside successfully, and I think they're under, like, Seaside success stories. And so you'll look at here. I don't have any exact benchmarks. I do know that there are a bunch of companies that are using it for production stuff, and if you look for, for benchmarks, then, then you'll get it. Uh, Seaside itself, head-to-head -head against Rails, is faster than Rails, because Smalltalk is just a lot faster than Rails, or than, than Ruby is. Like, the, the VM has been tuned for 20 years, and everything, while it's a dynamic language, everything gets compiled down, so it's really, really fast. There is memory overhead with the continuations in, in Seaside, but they are not particularly slow. If you do like a Hello World in Seaside versus Rails, Hello World in Seaside smokes it. I've done that one. And um, I, I guess the other aspect is, you know, if I'm going to treat Seaside as a service and call out to it and use Mechanize with it, that follows the same rules as, as any other kind of software as a service, right? I know like uh, Amazon and, and Kobe's team both, both like write a ton of services and then have a Rails app hit those. So it's a proven architecture, right? It works, but you know, if you have one service sitting uh, on the other side of the country as, as the client, then you're going to be completely hosed, right? So you need low latency there. Um, okay, I'm, my voice is, is, my throat is starting to hurt, so unless I have any, you know, anybody's like dying to know something that, that, they, that we can't do over email or Twitter or, you know, after I get water, um, I think I'll call it a uh, lunch hour. <laughs>